I give you a drawing, my friends, as a way of beginning this artifact. And it is a drawing of a statue originally taken from the Parthenon. Way back when, when we looked at the, Parth the Parthenon, I talked about the sculpture that were in the pediment, many of which were stolen and taken to Great Britain. And um, there they remain. And one of the things that happened over the, the centuries that followed is that plaster casts were made of these objects and shared in museums and art schools around the Euro around Europe. And so what you're looking at here is a depiction of Apollo based on a, a plaster cast. And this drawing was made by an artist who did so when he was 12 years old. And I want to ask you a question. Now, I never took an art class and I don't, I can't draw and I don't want to learn, I suppose. Um, but I ask you, do you think this 12 year old knows how to draw okay? And if your answer is yes, raise your hand. Fantastic. I see everyone but you, but that's fine. We'll go on. I give you here a painting that same art maker did when 14 years old. This is, as far as I know, the first oil painting that they did. It's called the First Holy Communion. And I ask you a simple question. This 14-year-old, do you think they know how to handle oil paint? Raise your hands. Yes? Okay, good. So let's have a good discussion about what it means to be able to do a certain kind of thing and decide to do something completely else. I think we can agree that the art maker of this drawing and of this um, and of this painting has an understanding of draftsmanship, of handling of color, of shade and light and value and of space. And so if this be the case when they're a tweener or barely a teenager, I think the same could have been true for them when they were, I don't know, 20. And if they decided to do something else, it's not because they couldn't have done this when they were 12 or that when they were 14. It's instead they decided to do something else. So the art maker we're looking at is a guy named Pablo Picasso. 12 years old, 14 years old. Can Picasso do whatever he wants? Yes, he can. So just because he's going to change the way we look at the art world does not mean that he couldn't do this kind of thing when he was a wee little tyke. Picasso is a Spaniard by birth, although a Frenchman for most of his life because he leaves for France um, when he is still a young man. This was done when he first got there. Uh, he's about 19 years old. Picasso's life um, is a history of 20th century art. And I know I've said before, and I stand by this and we'll, we'll go down swinging with it. I believe that that Cezanne is the most important artist of the last 150 years, but Picasso is the most important artist of the last 100. And so that's the place where we start. Um, Picasso is an interesting guy. And I think, I think I have a good quote for you. And it's a quote that comes from Picasso talking about his mother. Um, so I don't know how much faith we can put in it, but I like it nonetheless. Picasso said, my mother, my mother once told me, Pablo, if you become a soldier, you'll become a general. And if you become a monk, you'll become the Pope. Instead, I became a painter and I became Picasso. I love that. It speaks to like Picasso's um, confidence when in his artistic maturity, because he knew that his name had become a kind of synonym for great art maker although he wasn't always so optimistic. And so we're gonna look at a couple of early self-portraits to talk about the shifting perceptions of Picasso's self uh, in his own life. And then we're going to look at um, some of his really famous paintings. I give you the image on the left-hand side, a self-portrait from 1901 and an image on the right, the same from 1906, painted within five years of one another. And so I ask you to think about the difference between these two works. And certainly one of them involves color. Um, these early works from Picasso from say 1901 to 1904 are called his blue period. 
because they often have a lot of blue in them. The second composition is from his so-called rose period. But beyond the difference in color, I think there's a difference in form as well. And actually, not only just form, but I also would suggest to you that there's an interest um, in the ways in which he's viewing himself. So if you were to describe the image on the left-hand side and ask you about Picasso, what does Picasso think about himself? I think we could agree that one of the things is that he looks thin or gaunt. Look at his cheekbones. I mean, look at his cheekbones here as compared to his cheekbones when he's a little bit younger. Doesn't this face seem to be thinner, a little more gaunt? Doesn't he seem to be closed? In a lot of ways, this is the starving artist period of Picasso's life. Um, on my own face, when I when I weigh 190 pounds, as I have, I have big, full cheeks. When I weigh 170 pounds, as I sometimes do, I have cheekbones. This is a cheekbone kind of image for Picasso. If we look at the image on the right-hand side, painted five years later, there's a greater sense of vitality, isn't there? I mean, I think in some ways, this is a strong, this is a powerful, this is a ready-to-rip-a-phone-book-apart kind of Picasso. Look at those forearms. They are fleshy. Look at his upper body. It is broad. Um, there is a change that happens here. And when you look at the faces as well, you can see the beginnings, even in 1905, of the ways in which Van, the, pardon me, Picasso is going to break with a rendering of space. And it is this break that fully happens in 1907 that will be the defining mark of the early part of Picasso's career. Now, let me say something that's kind of important, and that is one could teach an entire course on the first 70 years of, of 20th century art using nothing but Picasso art, because Picasso is both influencing and shaping and responding to almost every major period of art that exists in the 20th century. We're not gonna do that work today. We're gonna look at Picasso between 1900 and 1912, but please know that what Picasso is doing in the art world um, could have, um, could an entire course could be taught around it. Something else I want you to look at when you look at the, the 19, uh, the 1906 self-portrait, and I want you to look at Picasso's head and the relationship of his eyes to the position of his face. And think about the ways in which, if you look closely, it might just be a little off balance. And this might seem the same too. This is his portrait of Gertrude Stein. Gertrude Stein is an American expatriate living in Paris uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And this is Picasso's image of her from 1907. And if you think about this image, at first you might not really understand or appreciate the way in which it looks a little bit unusual. But the more you look at it and the more you examine it, the more you might begin to appreciate some of the things that Picasso is working through, even in this early 1907 image. For example, her face, doesn't it seems to have a kind of plastic or synthetic aesthetic to it, almost waxy. And that idea is going to come around to us in the next picture we look at. Also, when you look at her face, the eyes don't match up in a way in which meets our expectations for what the face of a person looks like. This, I mean, like, it looks like one eye is looking at you and the other eye is looking at Steve over there. This idea, Picasso is working through, borrowing from, and adapting uh, away from Cezanne, right? Like Cezanne was like, hey, stop, slow down, look at this image and look at it enough to where your brain can put it together. Picasso is embracing this idea. So one of the things he's working through is how to alter our expectations as it revolves perspective and space and three-dimensionality. This face almost seems to be mask-like in nature. Doesn't it 
like like you could take it off and there is another woman underneath there's a sense of flatness to it um the eyes look a bit off the nose looks like it has been stuck on it the lips look wax like this is the beginning of what picasso began working through in the rest of that calendrical year this is a portrait of Picasso in his studio in 1908, and I want to call your attention to some of the things that are around him. Picasso had a very good friend who uh, worked as a curator at a Parisian museum that was then called, at the beginning of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, excuse me, the Museum of Man. And it wasn't really conceived of as an art museum in the way in which the Louvre or the Orsay was, and instead it was a kind of ethnographic museum. France, like England, like Holland, like Germany, like Spain, was in the centuries prior to the 20th, a great colonial power, right? France had colonies all over the place. Vietnam, French colony, Louisiana, French colony, parts of Canada, French colony. And when a great white power goes to other places and colonizes it, um, they often bring back art and artifacts from that culture to their homeland. And so the art, the, the, um, the Museum of Man had collected many of these kinds of works. And what you're looking at behind him are a variety of art and artifacts from the Benin culture in West Africa. Picasso became in, uh, greatly infatuated and intrigued by the representations of, of humankind by non-Western cultures for the same reason that, that artists in France were fascinated by, by the, the art and architecture of Japan at this same time frame because it was so different and unexpected and Picasso begins to incorporate those ideas into his own art. And I think we can make something like that out here when we think about what is his most famous painting, La Demoiselle d'Avignon, painted between June and July of 1907. Now, one of the things I hope I have reiterated during the course of this class is that I'm not a you need to know this date kind of guy. And I've given you only two dates that I care that you know about. The Edict of Milan in 313, which legalizes the Christian faith. Christmas Day of 800, which is the date in which um, Charlemagne goes to Rome and is crowned Holy Roman Emperor on the steps of St. Peter's. And then this date, 1907, because that's the date of this painting. And for my money, this is the most important painting of the last 120 years because it shows a complete break with some of the artistic conventions that artists have held onto since the Renaissance, if not before. And that is the rendering space, the rendering of the female or human figure, um, and the ways in which we conceive of self. So let's think about this object. We have five women who are present. There are five female nudes that are standing around and Picasso um, had, spoke and wrote about this object. These are women who are working in the Avignon district or the, 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 the prostitute district of Avignon. They are all shown in different kinds of ways with different body positions. And some of them, you can almost imagine we could flip them on their side and they would look like the reclining nudes we've looked at from Titian to Ang to Manet. But Picasso is unwilling, honestly, to give us a depiction that we're willing to accept. So let's start with lucky bachelorette number one here. Her body has been broken down into a series of geometric shapes. You can see her lower leg, her thigh, which inexplicably kind of meet here with this very bizarre lower hip section. The upper body is composed of a couple of triangles and a trapezoid. And I, this, I suppose, is her arm. And she seems to have a mask on to say nothing of the scary fact that she seems to be facing away from us, but facing towards us. Her body is, this is her back. She's facing like the back of the painting, but her head has turned around. And there's only two creatures that can do that as far as I know of. The first is an owl, 
whoo, she's not an owl. And the second is the the uh, the exorcist child from the freaking movie from like 73. And ask your parents. Uh, she's not that. So what Picasso has quite literally done is given us on the same figure two separate views of her. We have a view of her from the front, her head, a view of her from the back, her body. And Picasso does that with all of these figures, right? Let's look at this one. Her arm raised, her upper body tilted at a degree, her legs have been, have been broken down into a series of geometric shapes. What Picasso is trying to do is give us a variety of views of the same object and allowing us in our own mind's eye a way of seeing these and putting them together. That's the goal. And we call this artistic period cubism. Cubism. Because what he's really interested in doing is creating uh, the human body out of a variety of geometric shapes. Now, I'll tell you, when I first took an art history class, I thought we called cubism cubism because Picasso was from Cuba. He's not. <laughs> it's not. It's not called cubism because he's from Cuba. It's called cubism because he's breaking forms down into a variety of geometric shapes as a way of providing us a challenge as a viewer to put it all together. And clearly he is embracing this idea of different cultures by showing these women wearing these African masks. Three of them are within this composition. And I'll show you a preparatory, a preparatory drawing for this because you can see the ways in which early on he, he conceived of this as having two male figures in it as well. Both he described them as a medical student and as a sailor, but he removed them so as to keep our attention on the female figures. We have a, a, um, a still life here in the foreground, but even that, even this watermelon and this pear and orange and grapes, he can't help himself from breaking that up into geometric shapes. And this, my friends, is just the beginning. For in 1907, he starts this process, and it will continue on until he eventually makes, thing, makes the form become so abstracted that it takes almost an imagination to get there. If Le Demoiselles d'Avignon from 1907 is the introduction to this process, three women from 08 and Girl with a Mandolin from 1910 shows the ways in which he will take this, this form. Like these figures have been further, um, further abstracted and you can sort of see the head, the eyes, and the, the, and the arms and bodies further abstracted. And this is a really important idea. When we go to 1910, we can see the ways in which these figures are also changing. So when we think about this object, we can think about these figures, right? Look at this woman and think about the ways in which Picasso has abstracted her head, her hair, her eye. The fact that she's holding this mandolin and it's been exploded almost. Her arm doesn't match up. Think about the view of her breast and her upper torso. The paintings become relatively monochromatic. And that's important because we will see him continue this throughout the 19 teens. But in a lot of ways, it looks like he has taken a drawing, cut it up and reassembled it. This idea will play out further through from 1910 on. And this is a great example of where he will go just a little bit later, because this is his portrait of one of his most influential patrons. Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, also painted in 1910. By this time, it takes imagination to get where we're going, right? And, I'll, and, I'll, and if we were in a classroom, I would have you look at this for three minutes and then think about what it is you see. But look, we have our head. We have a quaff of hair. Eye, eye, nose, and a little smile. When we look at the upper body, you can see his hands the arms coming down, 
look, he's got a pocket watch on his blazer. All of this is an attempt to completely abstract the body. And way back when, when we were looking at Gauguin and we talked about the breakdown in non-representational forms, by the, by the time we get to Picasso, Gauguin and the other post-impressionists almost seem quaint. This has been abstracted to such an extent that we hardly know what to do with it. Picasso takes this even further beginning in 1912, where he invents a new form of art making. You and I call it cubism, or pardon me, call it collage. So when I was in elementary school, you know, they give us a pair of safety scissors, some paste and, and some construction paper, and they'd say, go make a work of art. Yeah, Picasso invents that. And so here you can see him working with cut paper. Um, Sue's is an after dinner drink, um, construction paper, newspaper print. And he creates this using shape and color and newspaper print as a way of constructing a kind of a visually pleasing form. For example, like this figure here, we didn't look at this in this class, but you can kind of make out a head, a neck, and a fancy hat. I give you a statue of Nefertiti, right? These are the kinds of things that Picasso becomes fascinated with in the 1912s. And the art makers who surround him run with this idea in a way that's pretty profound. One of the art makers that does is an art maker named Marcel Duchamp. And this is his work from 1912. But as a way of getting there, I want to talk about the birth of this movement, which is called Futurism. Picasso is not the only cubist. Um, he develops the style with an artist named Georges Braque as well, but it's certainly Picasso who is most famous today. There are art makers who follow the formal lead of Picasso as it pertains to cubism, but do so for slightly different ends. There aren't many art movements that actually have a birthday, so to speak, but the futurist time frame is for on the 20th of February in 1909, they publish their manifesto in a French newspaper called Le Figaro. And in it, they talk about their interest in the speed of modern urban life. And one of the things they're fascinated with is motion. Now, I don't mean to suggest to you that this art maker, a man named Edward Mayabridge was a futurist artist. He was a photographer who was interested in the, the, the process of animal locomotion, but certainly he was interested in motion. And so this was a series of experiments to prove that when a horse gallops, there's a moment in its stride when all of the feet are off of the ground, here you go, and a moment in its stride where two feet are on the ground, there you go. Beginning at the end of the, the 19th century, photography has been around for a while, but we develop something called radiography. And this is an x-ray of a person walking over time with lead bars in parts of their body to show how the body moves. The interest in motion becomes the thing that is gonna occupy many of the futuristic painters and Giacomo Balla is one of them. This is his early painting a girl portrait of a girl running on a balcony and i think you can make out can't you the idea that using a little bit of Seurat, he and uh and maybe a dash of Cezanne, he has rendered one two three four five six seven eight nine or so separate images of an abstracted female figure walking across a balcony the subject of this painting in many ways is that of motion. I think the same is true of this, right? It's not really a subject of anything other than like the movement of a leash, the feet and, uh, and, and rapidly wagging tail of a wiener dog. So futurism in many ways is this embrace of motion and this really lands in the United States in 1913. 
1913, we have the opening in Lower Manhattan of what historians have called the Armory Show. And I say this as an Americanist by training. American art, all things considered, is kind of boring. There's not a lot of exciting things. We're very traditional, a strong adherence toward realism and representation. And in 1913, we have the arrival of modern art in the United States. Um, and I pause to read the, the bottom part here. Among the guests will be Ang, Delacroix, Degas, Cezanne, Radon, Renoir, Monet, Seurat, and Van Gogh. Now, I pause here to say none of them are real guests. They're all dead, but their paintings showed up and introduced the United States to modern art. And one of the current art makers who showed up was a guy named Marcel Duchamp. And this is his famous nude descending a staircase. And I want you to look at this and think about what the subject is. In some ways, it looks like what Picasso was doing. But Picasso's interest was in showing us multiple views of the same form. And Duchamp does that. But what he does is different. He wants to show us a sense of motion. This thing is about time, isn't it? In order for someone to move, time has to happen. And that's very much the case here. That this object is moving over a set amount of time and you can make out, can't you? The idea of these hips moving down this stairwell. And this was in many ways a laughing stock during the armory show. People didn't know what to make out of this. Uh, it was a complete puzzlement to everyone. And as a result, um, Duchamp uh, decided to push the, the, the envelope even further. Beginning in the middle of the 19 teens, we begin to see things that are slightly different. This is a work um, from 1916. It's called L-H-O-O-Q. And I'll say more about the title in a second. And I wanna talk about what Duchamp did here because he did not paint the Mona Lisa. We didn't look at the Mona Lisa in this class, but he didn't paint it, Leonardo did. But what he did here is he went to a the museum, uh, the Louvre, where it is, bought a postcard of it, and then took out a marker and gave her a goatee and, and a mustache. And then he signed it and gave it a title. And, and the title, um, when sounded out um, in, in French, um, makes a disparaging comment about her backside. Kind of like you could use the letters I see you. Um, and that can mean like, I see you, like I see you over there. The letters here um, sound out a comment about her, uh, about her rump. This art period we call Dada. It's like a word that doesn't actually mean anything. And Duchamp was playing with this idea of art not meaning anything. He's like, if I'm an artist, if I make it, it's a work of art. And that certainly is true of something like this. This is his fountain from 1917. And I want to talk a little bit about this because I think it's an interesting object. Once you can uh, wrap your mind around it. Duchamp didn't make this urinal. Sorry, spoiler alert. It's a urinal, right? He didn't make it. He didn't make it. It's a urinal. He bought it um, and then turned it on its side, signed it with a pseudonym, our mutt, dated it in 1917. So he did not make this. But one day when walking around lower Manhattan, he saw a... Uh, uh, a plumbing store went in, bought the urinal, and decided to send this off to an art exhibit under an assumed name, Armut. Um, and the art exhibit was juriedless. And so what it, what it was is, if you pay the entry fee, your work of art is shown. And so it was a way of testing the boundaries of what could or could not be considered art. Duchamp did this, signed it, sent it off with the $5 entry fee, and the $5 was returned, including this. And the idea was, well, it's not a work of art. And 
And Duchamp was kind of perplexed because in some ways what he has done is kind of artistic, right? He has reimagined a thing that is meant for a thing and imagine it as something else. So there's a certain art in that, but it also is not about the creation. He neither designed nor made this urinal. What he did is reimagine its function or its purpose. And his claim was, I'm an artist. If I make it, it's a work of art. What are you talking about? How can it not be art? I, I've made this. And the, 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 jur or the, the organization essentially said, but you didn't make it. You bought it and you signed it. He's like, that's the making. We've often thought about art being something to do with beauty, right? The reason why we like things is because they're beautiful or they're pleasing. And Duchamp was pushing the boundaries of aesthetics and function. Does art have an obligation to be beautiful? I mean, we've already moved away from the idea of truth. Does it have to be beautiful? Do you have to like it? Um, a little while ago, I was talking with a coworker about a film that I greatly admire. If you haven't seen it, you should. It was made in 93 It's um, or maybe 94, one of those two. Uh, it's called Schindler's List. It's made by Steven Spielberg. The movie's hard to watch. Right? It's difficult to watch. It's uncomfortable to watch. And at the end of it, you kind of feel empty inside. It's not beautiful. It's horrible. It's it's brilliant, but hor it's oh God. Right? Like spoiler alert. A lot of people are gonna die. Um, but it's not pretty to look at in some ways. It's hard to look at. And so Duchamp and the artists who follow in the Dada period are challenging very deliberately what art is, what art can do, and what all of that can mean. And we're just getting started because next up, we're gonna look at the things made in the middle of the 20th century with the abstract expressionists, namely a guy named Jackson Pollock and a guy named Mark Rothko. This is coming next.